Hold, please. Yes, ma'am. Ms. Parker? Here. Mr. Bowen is absent. Mr. Kane? Here. Mr. Chris is absent. Mr. Knuckles? Here. We have a quorum. Very good. Okay, if in your packets, you'll look at the minutes from our previous meeting on June 15th. Um, for any, anything, and what would your pleasure be? You need a motion to approve the minutes. I'm sorry. What do you need a motion to approve? Yes, a motion. You need a motion. Okay, I'll make a motion to approve. Okay. The minutes. Second. Motion has been a, uh, made by Mr. Kane for approval of minutes. Second by Mr. Knuckles. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those same sign. Okay, very good. Thank you. Okay, we'll go to second A, report from public safety departments, emergency risk management, emergency manager. Good evening. Hello. Um, thank you for letting me speak tonight. Uh, mine's going to go super fast. So I uh, just wanted to show uh, what we've done in the last, since the last quarter, I believe we meet quarterly um, <clears throat> as far as risk or as far as public safety, which goes. So a few things that came up, uh, uh, guys probably weren't aware that we did a city safety, a, a city site visit. I was working with the uh, New Mexico self insurers fund on that. Uh, of course, everybody's aware of the water break that we that we had, and I'm certain you guys probably aren't aware of the winter storm that we had. So, uh, the first one is Chris. <laughs> um, so this is going to be the uh, the safety the the site meeting, the city site meeting. Working with the Mexico Self Insurance Fund, they sent a representative down, and I worked with him for the week of October 24th to the 27th. We visited, I wouldn't say every single property that the city owns, but most properties that were over $90,000 or some that were simply complicated, they were grouped together where they shouldn't have been. Um, for example, the the water um, the water plant, the recycling plant, it was all grouped up as one property, even though it should have been grouped up as I think five or six, we split that up. So we basically just worked around and organized city property, which is gonna help with uh, insurance if we have any incidences with physical buildings. Mostly it's going to be a, what would be the replacement cost for the building if, if uh, the building was demolished or damaged, severely damaged. Um, uh, Chris, yes. Um, lessons learned on that one. What we, we currently have a book, a physical copy of each property uh, photo so we can recognize it, their address and what they're worth according to the, the insurer's fund. I'm gonna update that book so it's, uh, uh, well, updated. Uh, I won't be able to do it until it gets uh, uploaded to the website, but once that happens, we'll get a much more uh, updated book. Uh, the next one, of course, is the water break. Everybody was aware of when we had the water break that occurred right before midnight on November 2nd. And when by the time that the boil no notice was cleared, it was November 5th. Um, the entire community uh, worked together for this, it wasn't just city, it wasn't just county, it was private businesses. As far as emergency management goes, I helped, I assisted with the potable water. Uh, we had several uh, individual uh, businesses who, who helped together with that. We had uh, the Ministerial Alliance uh, allowed a, a lot of their volunteers to help man the, the, uh, the potable water stations. Chris, <clears throat> lessons learned on that. Quite a bit. There's a lot of lessons. That wonder, the wonderful thing about a situation like this is there's always room for improvement. Uh, it's very rare. It's almost impossible to do it 100%. So it gives you a lot of room to learn, a lot of room to expand, and a lot of room to improve. But one of the things we're going to do is I'm going to be working with um, uh, several department heads, and we're going to try to get a um, call trees listed up. We're going to try to get um, a checklist of exactly what to do when these situations go. Of course, everybody, they already have one, but we're trying to get a, a one together for specific situations. I'll be working mostly with Susan on that one, and we're going to expand from there. And um, we're going to try to get mass notifications templates down for specific items. Uh, Chris? <clears throat> and the one you guys probably weren't aware of, the winter storm that we had. Uh, the winter storm hit on the day before Thanksgiving. 
it was going to, it lasted two days and we expected to have four to eight inches of snow within that two day period. At the end of that period, we had about one inch, if we're lucky in the city. So I think some places in the county might have had two inches, uh, but we did try to prepare for that. Uh, Chris, uh, I did speak with the Ministerial Alliance. Uh, Ministerial Alliance already has a working relationship with the police department to house homeless people, people in need on, on situations like this or several different situations, but they can allow for hotel rooms. So I, I called them up, make certain that we had their most up-to-date person since it was the holiday. I want to make certain that the contact was the current contact and let them be aware that we might be sending people over there. And uh, one of the problems that they did run into, there's one individual who has is no longer welcome at the hotel. So he's going to be trying to work together at uh, an option for that individual possibly to go to a, a, a place in Clovis if they accept that that support. Uh, there's going to be some transportation issues. So I had to speak with working with with uh, Ministerial Alliance, see if we can fix those transportation issues for that particular individual. And also based on this, we're trying to work, uh, trying to get some care packages together, uh, winter and summer care packages, since they're going to be needing different different items for that. Um, I was looking into grants for that. And actually, the United Way is, is going to be conducting a homeless uh, count at the end of next month. And we're going to get an official count of everybody. And one of those uh, incentives to get homeless people to work with our count, the survey, is going to be get, putting together care packages. So I'm actually going to be working closely with the United Way to see what options we have in care packages. I think that they were able to get one down to $18 with the backpack, gloves, hat, uh, just variety of items to go in there. It's a pretty decent package, but for $18, it's not bad. So we'll be working with them, trying to figure out what we can do on those. Uh, next one. Those are the three major issues that, that we work with that I believe ties in with this committee. Um, the next quarter goals is um, one of the retired uh, uh, fire chiefs uh, of battalion chiefs, I believe, um, Lance Hill. He's going to be doing a uh, critical incident stress debriefing training, uh, hopefully in January. And once he gets that signed up, I'm going to go ahead and, and join that. I've actually done that training before, but through a little bit of mishaps, I didn't get the accreditation for it. So I'm going to definitely enjoy doing that. And that's going to help support local um, responders. Uh, next one would be uh, certified risk management classes. I'm going to be taking the risk management classes. I've been taking those for the last few months. I'm just going to continue that, try to get the certification risk management. And at the end of this, at the first quarter, uh, we should be awarded uh, the grant to create an all hazard mitigation plan. That's going to take up quite a bit of time in the next 12 months to 18 months. It's a very intense plan. We're going to be working with a contractor with this grant money, trying to hire a contractor and working with the city, county entities, and surrounding counties entities to try to get that plan set up. It's it's re it's a requirement for several several things from the state, from the federal government. Uh, we should we're supposed to have one now, and we never actually had one. So we're going to create a brand new one, and it should last, I believe five years, three to five years until it needs to be updated. But we, we're working from zero on this. So that's why it's going to take a grant and up to 18 months, if not uh, between 18 months and at the worst case scenario, up to two years. But our goal is 18 months once we get the grant. And Chris, and that's it. Uh, do you have any questions? I like the pictures of the cars that you have on yours. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> really cool. Uh, does anybody have any questions or any comments? No, good job. Thank you Thank very you, much. Okay, let us know if we, we can do anything for you. <clears throat> okay, and next we have is number two, fire department. Chief Thank Captain. you, Madam Chairman and committee. Uh, feel free to stop me at any point if you have a question. Uh, as always, our mission is to be prepared and ready to serve to provide the highest quality service to our community. Uh, the chairman asked for a quick budget update. Um, if you go to the third slide, please, ma'am. Um, our fund or our budget is made up of three different funds uh, from the city is the general fund or 101 fire fund from the state fire marshal's office and EMS funds in the New Mexico Department of Health. And start, we look at our general fund or 101. Uh, these are just a few of the highlights um, for full-time positions. Can you go back one, please? 
Thank you, uh, two. Hang on. Anyway, um, full-time positions, we had a lot of positions open throughout the year. So there's been a lot in what's called salary savings, which is good from a finance standpoint, but bad from a operational standpoint as far as staffing. Overtime has been blown out of the water due to that staffing crisis. Uh, there's only 34.74% left in that fund. Uh, in maintenance, it's been hit very hard uh, in all three of our funds because of aging units and increase in call volume. Medical supplies is doing pretty well because we've utilized the EMS fund before we've hit general fund for our EMS supplies. So right now it's sitting at a little over 74%. Uh, fuel, as expected with the increase in fuel prices, uh, there's only 40, a little less than 42% left in that fund. And then in employee training, we're doing pretty well. Uh, we've utilized the EMS fund first, as I said before, but also the opportunity scholarship has helped quite a bit for our EMS classes. So that's saved us quite a bit of money and been very beneficial so far this year. Next slide, please, ma'am. Uh, EMS fund, uh, we received $15,000 a year from the Fund Act from the New Mexico Department of Health. Uh, that fund is pretty much zeroed out. There's only about $70 left in that fund as of December 9th. Uh, it's been utilized for training, maintenance, and medical supplies so far. Moving on to fire fund, uh, maintenance has been hit pretty hard. Um, we've allocated quite a bit of money in that fund, uh, but there's only a little less than 41% left in it. Uh, in non-capital, there's a little over 36% left. Uh, we've utilized that for equipment purchases, such as radios and fire hose and stuff like that. And then again, the employee training is doing a little bit better because the opportunity scholarship has helped quite a bit. Uh, in fire fund, our total distribution is a little over 357000 a year. Uh, we do have two loans to the New Mexico Finance Authority for our ladder truck and our new station, uh, which is pulled out off the top. It's just under 100000 that leaves the $258,565 uh, that's distributed in two disbursements throughout the year. Um, moving on to grant awards, we've been very blessed over the last year. Um, we received $20,000 from the Trauma System Development Grant that bought a uh, third Berno power stretcher. Um, then we were also awarded a little over 162000 for SCBAs to complete our project to get all new SCBAs, bottles, masks, harness kits, and laundry bags so that we can wash those and decontaminate them after a fire. Some of the app grant applications that we've filed for this year, uh, we applied for a new 4x4 Type 1 ambulance uh, projected to cost about $255,000. That grant requires a 25% match that the city's allowing us to budget for next year if we're awarded. Um, this local systems improvement project grant, we applied for a medication dispensing machine to better keep track of our medications and have less waste and keep track of expired medications and to provide a little bit more accountability for our personnel. And then finally, on the trauma system development grant for fiscal year 24, we applied for the fourth powered stretcher that we'll need, and the cost for that's a little over $20,000. Uh, moving on to looking at our call volume so far this year, uh, we've ran a little over 3,300 calls, <clears throat> 2,868 are EMS, 464 fire. Uh, outside the city limits, there's been 718 calls, 511 EMS, and 207 fire. Every month, on average, there's 80 instances where multiple calls come in um, that we don't have enough personnel to respond to at that time. Uh, creating a possible delay in response and care to our community, risking their safety. In evaluating our run volume, it's pretty much the same slide as y'all saw last meeting a quarter ago. Uh, we're on pace to hit over 3,600 calls this year, um, which is a big increase from two years ago. The highest increase was from 2021, where we saw over a 28% increase. Moving on to shift staffing, calls 24 hours and turnover. The only thing that's changed on this slide is we've lost two more personnel to turnover uh, since our previous meeting. Um, right now, uh, we're doing a little bit better in staffing. If you look at the next slide, um, it's broken down by each shift, uh, one shift. We have one open position right now. Um, we've just hired three this week and two the pay period before that. So that puts us with eight personnel, including the open spot with no certifications. And then two shifts have one EMT basic and one shift has two EMT basics. And then intermediates A and C shift have three and B shift has two. And then as far as paramedics, we have one on A shift, two on B shift and one on C shift. 
Uh, we currently have two personnel that have completed paramedic and awaiting testing tomorrow, actually. Four intermediates and three NT basics. Well, four. Counting our clerk. Uh, that will be testing for EMT basic in January. Some upcoming classes. Uh, we have one personnel that's one semester in to his paramedic program. We'll have three personnel starting in January through a paramedic program in Hobbs through EMU Roswell. And we have hopes to have four ENT basics in class in January. We're unsure if that's going to be at CCC or ENME Roswell at this time. For fire classes, uh, we've teamed up with Clovis Fire Department yet again. Uh, we're joining their HAZMAT class, Awareness and Operations, in January with six of our new personnel. And then also in January, we're teaming up with them. And we're actually hosting uh, Battalion Chief Shears in charge of the Firefighter 1 and 2 class, uh, where we'll have five personnel. And then later on in the spring, we're going to catch the other HAZMAT guys after they pass that class up to their firefighter one and two and get them trained up. With all the salary savings, um, I approached finance and the city manager, and they've graciously allowed me to institute a kind of creative plan. We were kicking around because of the staffing crisis, a 72 schedule where we're on 72, off 72, and only having two shifts. We met as a department and decided that that wasn't the best idea. And we came up with a plan to utilize that funding in a more creative way to make their jobs a little bit easier um, and also help with recruitment and retention. Uh, we are eliminating our residential requirement and we're going to a voluntary overtone, overtime and holdover instead of mandatory pager. Uh, and we're doing a trial of that right now. And so far after three weeks, it's going pretty well. And it seems like it's having a positive impact on our personnel with no negative impact on our service that we're providing the community. We're also going to get computers in the ambulances with the internet and CAD and reporting system. And our monitors will be able to communicate with not only the hospital, but also the reporting system to hopefully decrease the guys reporting times and make their jobs a little bit easier. Uh, we were going to a phone dispatch system. We're waiting on the CAD integration from Tyler Technologies to I am responding so that we can have phone dispatch. We're going to work towards updating our EMS billing software to make Patty and her clerk Emma's job a little bit easier and make it to where our servers held or hosted rather virtually. And it will create a whole lot of less burden for our billing personnel. Uh, we were also able to purchase all new mattresses for Station 1. And like I said before, so far it's had a positive impact. We did a survey before we started, right before we had our meeting uh, to determine personnel's mental state, how their morale is, their home life, work-life balance, and so on. And we're going to do a follow-up study probably in January sometime to see how it's impacting it and track that progress. And that's all I have for you. And I'll be glad to answer any questions. Chief? Yes, sir. Um, on your voluntary overtime and holdover, are you eliminating pager pay? Or? Yes, sir. Um, if it does go through and it is a positive thing, we hope to utilize that recurring fund to cover the costs of the recurring plan as far as the internet and the ambulances, the billing software, and so on, and replacement of the computers for the ambulances. That way there's no increased recurring cost to the city, right. but it still maintains coverage. Right, so basically there's no incentive. It becomes voluntary, and this was not my decision. This was a decision that my personnel brought to me. And therefore, I began working out the logistics and asking the questions to see if we could try it. Right. So no, it would not be required. And the only incentive is they're paid overtime when they work. Right. Okay, thank you. Any questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Hello. Madam Chair, members of the committee. Uh, it seems like the biggest hot topic we've had recently in town is traffic, whether it's parking, speeding, or whatever. So when I went to the uh, 
Municipal League Conference this year, I've met up with the company Navoa Global, who has speed enforcement via cameras. Uh, the biggest part of it is, you know, through school zones, which we all know is a top priority for safety of our children. So <clears throat> when COVID was lifted, we had a big problem with people returning to the roadways and everything else. So our traffic has increased. Our call volume increases along with it. So therefore the officers that we have which aren't enough to do everything in the first place, don't have the ability to free up to go work the school zones and everything else as much. <clears throat> you know, we're seeing more traffic coming to town and everything else. And so Novoa had sent us their, um, basically a traffic counter. It's a radar unit that was in a box, battery powered. We put it on poles throughout town and in the variety of the school zones. And we identified several of them that were going to be our hot item areas, I guess. Um, so our vehicle crashes in 2020 were 311 for the year, last year 305, and this year as of yesterday was at 364. So we've seen an increase in the, in the crashes. In fact, we had two fatalities in town this year that uh, speed was a major factor in those. So I think we definitely have some other needs that will apply with that too. Um, but due to trap, due to staffing and traffic concerns, you know, we found this company which acts as a force multiplier for us. Uh, the cameras will be permanently fixed to a location, typically in the school zone, just because there's already power with the flashing beacons um, and speaking with Mr. Kane and the other people, we know that right over here on Abilene, we don't have the flashing lights and the speeding here, well, all up and down most of our streets, especially Abilene and some of the others is, is very bad. So New Mexico state statute allows for this to happen now. So it's uh, basically, it's a civil citation that goes out to them we would have to create a ordinance that adopts it as a, a nuisance for the speeding in these areas to allow us to get this to, to go into effect. Uh, I cited one uh, case law in here, the Titus versus city of Albuquerque, which the state Supreme Court upheld that doing the video traffic camera enforcement is okay. So I've also already adopted or adapted a uh, version of Albuquerque city ordinance that they use for this. And I've uh, sent it to Joanne so we can try to push that out to council along with the rest of this presentation. Um, but Novoa Global, they're contracted with Albuquerque right now. They're working with other uh, cities around the state to try to implement it as well. And uh, they've listed a few here that uh, they also currently use throughout the country. Um, so like I said, we, we set this up in uh, several of the areas around town where we know we get the most complaints and everything else. So we studied, uh, I put West 2nd, but it was actually West 1st Street and Avenue B. Uh, we set it up by the Women's Club building there. And then uh, 70 and Kilgore, which, after we did the data, it was fairly significant, but we also noticed that there was a lot of reductions in speed. We had it set up a little too close to the traffic light. So we had lower speeds uh, as they were going out and reduced speeds as they were coming in, slowing down for the light. So we need to either go a little further out one way or the other because these systems will work off of line of sight for a certain distance to do it. Uh, Chicago and Brazos, where we get a lot of the drag racing complaints. Uh, the school zones that really were bad were uh, Avenue C, the 400 block, but for Brown Early Childhood Center, uh, 1400 block of South Globe for Valencia Elementary, and on both sides of the Portales Junior High, 
uh, so about 400 block of Abilene and roughly the 400 block of third, kind of by the bus drop off there. <clears throat> so for Valencia, we had it up there for several days. Uh, and these are going to be numbers just from during the school zone hours. So these are for two hours a day. Uh, the 7.30 to 8.30 in the morning and 2.30 to 3.30 in the afternoon. So we had 236 vehicles go through that were at speeds 21 miles per hour or more over the speed limit. Over? Over. 21 miles an hour over? Yes, ma'am. So yeah, instead 36. of 15, they were going at least 36. Wow. Right. And that was... And then they figured, and then the company figured that if that rate were to continue throughout a month, we would see almost 5,000 violators that are going that much over that school zone speed limit. So, like I said, this is just during the school zone hours. This isn't even outside of those hours. When the highest speed that was recorded for somebody going through there during that time was 47 miles an hour. Jeez. So, 47 and a 15. Uh, Next reach 25, even the rest of the time. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. The next one we did was, uh, I have here is the junior high. So again, we had it up for several days on both locations. Uh, when it was set up on Abilene, there were 124 vehicles that went through going over 21 miles an hour. So this one we figured it at just six miles an hour over the speed limit, uh, partly because there's no flashing lights, it's just the signs. And they estimate that uh, it would be about 620 vehicles that were exceeding the speed limit in the month with the highest speed there of 34, which again, it's a 25, even outside of that. And then on third street, uh, we had people going 21 miles an hour or more over the speed limit, 386. So that means at least 36 in the school zone, which would give us a monthly average of almost 8,000 vehicles going through there, <coughs> going at least that fast during the school zone. And the highest speed in that one was 53. So again, that's even outside of school zone hours, that one's only at 35 as well. And then I failed to change the heading on this next one, but this is gonna be for the 400 block of South Avenue C by uh, uh, Brown Early Childhood Center. So again, it's a 25 mile an hour zone, even outside of school zone hours. But during the school zone hours, there were 810 vehicles that were going 21 miles an hour over the speed limit or not, which is at least 10 miles an hour over the posted speed limit even when it's not a school zone. So those are vehicles that are speeding either, either way. And that would give us an average of 4,050. And then I think I've probably forgot to do this. I can double check with the statistics later, but uh, I'm pretty sure this, the highest speed in that one was actually in the 60s. Uh, and then I've got just some of the, some of the rest of the data broke down in the next couple of slides where it's uh, first and Avenue B. Uh, I mean, in one day we had 9,374 vehicles go through on that stretch of road. Uh, of that, the highest speed recorded was 55. That's 25 as well. Even out in the 36 mile an hour or more, there was 216 and then there was People going uh, 26 to 35 miles an hour, there was over 6,000 on the one day. Uh, the second day listed there, it shows the highest speed, somebody going through at 74 miles an hour in that 25 mile an hour zone. Uh, um, the next one's got a continuation of that study from first and B with the highest speed of 74 on the, the second day on that page. And uh, on that first one, there's again over 9,000 vehicles going through that intersection right there. Uh, US 70 in Kilgore, which we all know is a bad one as well. Uh, like I said, even with the, the data, because when the company reviewed it, 
they're able to see more than just the numbers. They're able to watch it and tell, they can tell us if it's larger vehicles, smaller vehicles, mid-sized vehicles. Uh, so if we needed to, we can have them break that data down even more. But what they're going to do is send me the their traffic box again, and I'll set it up a little further, both sides of that intersection, so we can get a little better uh, detail on it. But I mean, even there, we have vehicles in the 45 mile an hour zone going 83, 73, 71, 67. Um, the eastbound and westbound, I mean, so westbound is coming into town, so we've got people hitting it at 73, uh, 79, 87 miles an hour coming into town. Uh, and, you know, we know we have a lot of crashes right there at Spruce in 70, Kilgore in 70. Uh, and it's just, we had one that went, what, halfway up the traffic light there not long ago uh, after they hit it. Um, and then I've got more of the data if you'd like to see it later on too, or I can have Christine pull it up if you'd like. Uh, but the next steps on this is working with the company to, to try to get the cost down. The biggest thing about this with the cost is it cannot come out of general funds. It has to come out of revenue from the fines. And so it's the company collects the fines, they send out the notices, an officer will review each one for a violation online and have to submit it. So they can remove, say, a emergency vehicle coming through that's going a little fast. And we can direct those to the appropriate department heads to say, we need to do this, or we can elect to identify the driver and send them the citation as well. Uh, but I mean, it might be a little more difficult with state police coming through or a county or whatever, but of course, if, if council approves this, we can they can select how they want us to go about that. But they, we do them on a three to five year contract. Uh, the options we have for paying are either per violation or we can do a fixed rate per month so the way it works is if it's a fixed rate per month, if, if during the month, say the school's out and it's not gener generating the revenue, then we won't have to pay anything. We're not going to see anything, but they'll hold it and then we'll, they'll recoup it down the road at a future uh, fines. If we do a per citation cost share, each citation, they take a certain amount out the state will get their cut and then they'll send us the city the cut at the end of the day to help pay for it all. So it's essentially a zero cost to the city for us to get a means to reduce these speeds through our school zones, through some of our other intersections and try to help curb this problem that we've got. I mean, any of us can go, I've, you know, I've been sitting at Sonic getting dinner and watching drag race by and you know it's it's getting pretty bad out there because unfortunately we can't be everywhere at once but these cameras can be there 24 hours a day seven days a week so you know the goal isn't to make money the goal is to get people to comply with the speed limits yeah. so we can have safer community for our motorists that are live here passing through the pedestrians the businesses I mean, just the other day we've had, you know, somebody took out a tree in the median on 70 by Sonic. Somebody took out the, the little wall at the cemetery. Uh, and I mean, we've got just crashes upon crashes all over the place. So we've got to try to do something to, to do this. And this is a way we can do it that we don't have to increase manpower, but we can generate the public awareness and everything else. If we did implement it, it would be a a lot of public uh, media push on it, uh, social media, different things like that, saying we're going to do this. We would implement a length amount of uh, an amount of time that we would have uh, warnings going out instead of actual citations. Uh, the city of Albuquerque has even uh, 
elected to allow for community service uh, four hours. At, so at the rate of $25 an hour is how they figure it to not have it be such a, a strain on some of our lower income families and people in town, especially if you have a child that's driving your car and you're the registered owner, so you get the citation. You can, we can have those options so it doesn't have any type of, you know, severe impact on some people who really can't afford it. But uh, the officer's time on it is really minimal. Uh, like I said, they sit there on the computer, they log in, they verify that the license plate matches what the return is, watch it, make sure that the speed's there, and then submit it. Uh, like I said, the company will then take those violators, mail them a notice with a website to go to, they put in their number, and then they can watch the video themselves. And uh, it's it's pretty neat. And you watch it and it shows here they are coming in, gets a nice close up on the license plate. Even with these license plate covers that are tinted and other things, you can still see. So it's they can try to get around the, the violations that way, but it's this, their camera system is very good. Um, so it's I, th I think it's a great opportunity for us to try to do a, a no cost to the city enforcement and hopefully that's a biggie right hopefully generate some voluntary compliance how many cameras do we currently have we have none so oh, so these were you bar. this was just off of a radar unit that they oh, okay give to us so this just gave us speed so that we could do the study okay so we currently so, have none right so if we get them say if we wanted to put them on third street by the junior high if we wanted to get traffic going both directions, we would need two cameras, one to get both ways, because all it does is capture the license plate in the back of the vehicle, so it won't catch the driver's face. So it'll, it goes that way. So depending on where we wanted to put it as to how we feel it's best, we can go one camera or two cameras on each one. If we do one camera, it's only going to get one direction. So like, say, if we decided to put one on first and B, it's a one-way street. We only need one camera. So. so we need to figure out how many cameras we would want. Right. I mean, and it's, like I said, it's not something where it's going to cost us money by electing to do more. It's just a matter of how many do we feel we should do. So. Well, I think that these statistics that you have provided us today. Yeah. Those are, yeah I mean, that's kind of. Right. It's scary. And when, yeah, they're hitting buildings, they're hitting trees, they're hitting yes. all yeah. sorts of things. It's, it's right. evident that they're definitely. I have a couple of questions. Yes, sir. One, would you put signs up like coming into town to show that we're speed is monitored this way we so can put, it, as a deterrent as well as to let right. people know? Right. We can put them up on the way into town, but they have to be up in the prior to entering the areas where the enforcement's actually oh, okay. going on. Too. So you can't so just put them up at the we can but We can put them up on the way into town. Right. Hey, you know, the city of And then where you actually have cameras, you have to have them. Right. Okay. Yes. But if you put them out there, a lot of people wouldn't know and they'd think, oh, i got to be careful all through town. Right. Okay. Absolutely. Now, the other question, like on first or second street, how do you, how do you, if, if one speeds up beside another vehicle, how do you know which vehicle is the one that's speeding? The system is really neat. It does time and distance, so it's not a radar unit. It's on the camera and it's tracking it by time and distance to figure that speed through the the time and distance. Uh, you know, after if it takes you two seconds to go this far, then you're going at this speed, and it continues to monitor it for a length of time through those videos. And uh, so it's. So it gets an so initial take the picture of the right car and it won't right. get the one beside it. Right. It's not just a photo. It's a video. So it's it indicates which vehicle it's tracking okay. and everything. So you can see them move up toward that. Yes. But like, I mean, if there's any of these, we've got the, the one is a summary. It's we have a summary with all of the zones. And then we also have the information here for 
the different school zones, Kilgore and 70, First and B, and the Chicago Brazos. If there's any of those you'd like to see more of the data on, we can open those up. So would you use these only during then, if we were to get these, would you use them only during school hours? And like you said, you set them for two hours, like at 7.30 to 8.30, 2.30 right. to 3.30. Yeah, that's just during the school zone hours, but we can elect to have them go all day. Okay. If you want, the okay. system will differentiate by the time, whether it's a school zone at that time or not. So it's there. Why wouldn't you use it right. the whole oh. time? Chief, I've got a question for you. Um, if if they uh, collect all the fines, what's your projected revenue loss there? I know each camera you said was about twenty nine hundred or around three thousand dollars. Right. I think for us, if we did the the fixed rate, uh -huh. then they also cap us on how many citations it would be during that month. So if we went with just a per citation violation which would work out better, especially if we actually see compliance, because then our cost per citation would stay the same yeah. instead of having the same over high overhead if it drops down. And then of course we can move these around in the future too. Right. Um, but they haven't given me any financial projections yet, okay. but it's, it's $100 across the board fine for it because it's a civil violation for as a nuisance. Uh -huh. And then the state, so the first cut would be, they would reduce it by the amount of time it takes our officers to go through. So that would come out so sure. the city could recover that cost. Right. The state would get 50%, I believe, of what remains after whatever the cost is that goes to the company. Does so, the state normally get money from a citation? Yes. That goes through municipal court? A portion goes through, um, I believe it's chapter three under the municipality stuff where it goes into a, a fund for the state. But then we typically only see fund a certain amount from each citation and it's all based on statute. I'm not even sure what it is we see, whatever the court normally collects. But I didn't know that. I thought if it was a municipal ticket, it probably all went to the city, but it doesn't. Right? No, sir. There's still that whole right. long list of fees and mm -hmm. everything where it goes to brain injury funds and other different things. And yeah. there's it's a long list of fines that are part of that. But with this one, it's we don't have to do any of the collection. The company does. If we have violators who aren't paying on time, they're going to keep in after them. Right. If they refuse to pay, they can take them to collections. Um, if the city will get a portion of yes, the hundred dollars, yes, sir. the city will get. I'm not sure what the cut is on it yet, but right. um, sounds like a great idea. I mean, even if with some of these numbers, it's people down. Mm -hmm. I mean, as long as it pays for itself and it does the prop and it yeah. slows people down, that's I think the the biggest thing. Yeah, I, I think it's a win win. So this is something we're definitely looking at towards coming towards count i mean to council yes ma'am okay it'll need it'll probably be uh next month when I uh do we need to recommend that at all joanne or is it just something that it's information right now right. okay i think if you wanted to recommend to support it it wouldn't hurt us but yes i think that would be something right. can we do that can you do one make a recommendation that when it does go to council that it did come to the public safety committee and sure. that we are recommending it and supporting this sure you can okay and i would remove that we recommend it to the council to move forward okay and i will second that okay so there's been a motion made and seconded that we do move forward to this and recommend it to the council All right i appreciate it because i think it's like I said, I think it's great. It's no cost to the city at all. That's the big. It thing. gives us it gives us a means to encourage the voluntary compliance. Yeah. So. Okay. Any other, anything else? Thank you. I guess we ought to vote on that though. Oh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, opposed. Same sign. Okay. Motion passes. So if you will make sure that that's in the notice, Joanne, for our next meeting. Okay. Um. Thank you very much, Thanks, Chief. Diego. Thank you, Chief Kathy, as well. Okay, so moving on to item B.
discussion regarding city ordinances and how public safety is affected by said ordinances. So attached to your packets as in a, on the paper clip are currently our ordinances um, as provided. And rather than go through each one and look at all of these, I think this is something um, that we as a public safety committee need to definitely be involved in and have some kind of say so. So I would like for you, if you would, please, is to take, you may take these with you and study these and make any kind of recommendations um, on what we can do. I know we've discussed this even on our council meetings that we have so many different ordinances that are outdated, that and there's no ordinance for it or whatever. So I think this is a start that maybe we could possibly come from the public safety committee that we could start looking at these things, making recommendations to the council on behalf of the public safety committee, um, as well as like with the police department, the emergency um, risk management department and the fire department. So this involves us, I mean, as the council was to look at it, you know, they would do another committee to look at it, to observe, but I think coming from the public safety, this would be really, really good. So if you will take these with you and just look at them and study them, if you have any questions, make notes, and then we can discuss it, and then we can kind of go from there. If you'd like for it to be sent to you as a PDF or a, no, a Word document so you can look at it, just let me know and I'll send it to you. Okay. 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 Okay, anything else? This is something, this would be a biggie. This would be a really, really big thing just to start looking at things that we can kind of start making some changes and just get these uh, on another note, on the same note. Yes. Uh, Fire Chief is, has requested that we start looking at the ordinance itself so that they can update because there's been an update to the um, fire code. Okay. And it's already adopted, so we're behind the eight ball. Oh, we need to get into, and it's basically to uh, adopt the uh, the state's plan for the state's fire code. Right. Okay. So he's requested that uh, earlier in the month, actually. Now, does the state override what we have? Oh, of course. So basically, we would just would step adopt up their code, adopt their code. Yes. Okay. I Which we've we always inserted something that says that we follow the state's. Yeah. Yes. And that would cover us not only for this time, but any time in the future. Yeah. Okay. Which really is nothing new. It, it's just something that's been updated. We have to adopt the updated right. version. Yeah. Okay. Good. And is that something that we would need to do soon or? Um, we'll be moving along. There's going to be other uh, ordinances that are going to be updated. And so there'll be a bunch of them coming to you. Okay. Okay. That'll be good. That'll be good. Okay, very good. Thank you, Joanne. Thank you, Chiefs. Anything else from the committee? Mr. Kane, Mr. Knuckles, no? Okay, I thank you all for being here tonight. I know it's right, like I said, Christmas is in, somebody said 10 days. So yeah. if you have not started your shopping, please do so at this time. <laughs> <laughs> and um Anything else? So we'll meet again in three months. Yes. Yes. Okay. Anybody has out anything else before that? Please let Joanne know. We can let the rest of the committee know and go from there. Okay. If there's nothing else, mm -hmm. this meeting is adjourned. Okay.